Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about XFT, uh, practical fault tolerance beyond crashes. So let's start with what we mean when we talk about fault tolerance. Uh, for high availability, we are trying to build systems that can tolerate machine and network faults. Uh, however, what kind of machine faults? So we uh, usually consider the fail stop model uh, where any fault is deemed as total loss. Uh, these are the crash faults, which we assume that the, where we assume that the machine just stops working completely. Uh, this works fine in practice uh, until it doesn't. So there is a whole gamut of data losses, omissions, data corruption, software bugs, et cetera, where we can uh, pragmatically assume total loss. So this is the arbitrary fault model where we considered all the non-crashed uh, or Byzantine faults. And uh, of course, we also have malicious behavior. So apart from the machine faults, we can also have network faults. Uh, uh, well, I, I guess calling an asynchronous network faulty could be debatable, but uh, it's a deliberate choice used by the authors and uh, it will make sense later. Uh, for now, uh, we have some machines which can communicate synchronously. That is the communication delay is bound by a delta. And uh, then there are some machines which are partitioned. That is, there are no message delay guarantees provided by the network. Uh, so on the left, you have synchronous machines. On the right, you have partition machines. So these make life uh, especially difficult if you are trying to you know, use this model or assume, put some guarantees on what the network provides you because it is difficult to distinguish a partition machine from a faulty machine. Now, since we are clear on the type of faults we can have, let's uh, first consider state machine replication in the crash fault tolerance model. Uh, so we have network faults on the X axis and uh, machine faults on the Y axis. Uh, so for example, the top left quadrant is when we have known crash faults, but uh, no network partitions. So in the absence of any non-crash faults, we have a consistency for any number of faults and availability as long as half, in the, half the machines in the system are not faulty. So even in the case of network partitions, we have availability guarantees as long as majority of machines are in the major partition and correct. So overall, the performance is good and the cost both in terms of machines needed and the uh, uh, round trips required to build a fault-tolerant replicated state machine is optimal. Uh, in the pre presence of non-crash faults, however, we don't get any guarantees, even if there are no network partitions. So for, for this, we use the Byzantine fault-tolerance model. Uh, so the Byzantine fault, uh, uh, building a state machine replication in the BFT model preserves the same consistency guarantees as the CFT model in case of crash, uh, in the case of crash faults. Uh, however, it adds on consistency and availability guarantees in case of non-crash fault uh, uh, when the network is synchronous. However, uh, I think uh, it's the top right quadrant uh, where the BFT model uh, really shines as it provides uh, consistency guarantees regardless of any number of partition machines as long as uh, two third of the machines are non faulty. However, uh, the availability is only guaranteed when two thirds of the machines are correct and synchronous. Uh, this may sound surprising, but uh, the higher threshold of correct and synchronous machines means that the BFT model is weaker in terms of availability guarantees as compared to the CFT model. Uh, additionally, its uh, performance is uh, poorer as compared to CFT. Uh, the costs required in terms of the additional T machines as compared to the CFT model, which requires uh, two T machines to tolerate T faults uh, and, uh, and the complex message patterns of the BFT protocols uh, means that the BFT systems uh, fall out of favor for uh, production systems. But I guess uh, the question that is asked uh, by the authors in the paper is that uh, we build applications with uh, really strong security guarantees, but the middleware that, it, 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 that we build the applications on 
it it's only designed in the CFT model, and it's designed to do only tolerate crash faults. So uh, I guess let's visit for a second why the uh, BFT model requires a higher threshold. So we have a storage system here with uh, three machines. I, and uh, yeah, this is a case where T equals one. So Alice on the left wants to send the message to Carol on the right. Uh, because of a network partition, however, the message only reaches the top two machines. Uh, for fault tolerance, Alice can wait for the machine at the bottom uh, because it can, as it says, we cannot differentiate between a network partition and a faulty machine. Now, uh, let's assume there is a, a data loss in the machine in the center. Uh, as such, this is an accidental fault. Uh, so this is not something that you can, can really prevent against by using authentication. Uh, now Carol comes and tries to read from the storage. Uh, there is a not, uh, let's say there is a network partition with the top machine. And now Carol can't uh, distinguish this from a case where Alice didn't write anything at all. So Carol, but now Carol has to complete it because it cannot wait for the top machine because it, again, it can be faulty. Uh, this this uh, seems like a, a contrived example, you know, a made up edge case, but uh, this is what defines the lower bounds of the BFT model. However, uh, if we really think about how real world systems are deployed, where the systems are geographically distributed uh, with machines sitting behind firewalls. Uh, it seems unlikely uh, for a malicious adversary to cause Byzantine faults and affect the network all in a coordinated manner. Uh, you can see in the example, we did a lot of work to you know, induce this scenario. Uh, so this applies, I think, more so to the accidental faults like uh, data corruption, because it's it's, seems highly improbable uh, that uh, you you know you would have a disk corruption and uh, you have network misconfigurations you know all in a particular way that a scenario like this uh, requires so once again uh, the cost of uh, bft comes from tolerating faults you know we the bft model bundles the uh, the byzantine faults with, with with the network partition so it, it is trying to, uh, the, the higher premium that we pay is to tolerate these kind of scenarios. So what the XFT model does is it, it puts the number of uh, network faults in the threshold as well. So as long as the total number of crash faults plus non-crash faults plus network faults affect a minority of machines, uh, the system should be able to hold. Uh, uh, more precisely, in the absence of non-crash faults, the XFT models uh, provides the same guarantees as the CFT model. In the presence of non-crash faults, if the number of faulty or partition machines is within the threshold, that is, if uh, they are in minority, then the system works fine. Otherwise, uh, the term that the author is used in the paper is that the system is said to be in anarchy. So I like to think of uh, the XFT model as such. So we can have some Byzantine or non-crash faulty machines. We cannot differentiate them from partition or crash faulty machines. So we require T plus one correct machines to complete our protocol. Uh, this is the BFT model. XFT looks more like this. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, having discussed the XFT model, let's uh, let's see what uh, what assuming the putting the network faults under the threshold biases like why do we actually have to do this so again we have network faults on the x axis machine faults on the y axis so xft preserves all of the guarantees of the cft model uh, however in the top left quadrant it provides the same guarantees as bft although now the threshold is smaller you know, uh, we now have a threshold of a majority of machines being correct rather than the two third required for the BFT model. The weaker aspect as compared to the BFT model is of course the top right case, wherein the concurrent presence of faulty and partition machines weakens the consistency guarantees as required uh, with the, as, as required to the, uh, as compared to the BFT model. 
uh, but this is exactly the kind of trade off that uh, the XFT model makes and uh, kind of argues that it is practical for uh, today's uh, machines or today's deployments. So uh, uh, that was the XFT model. Uh, uh, the authors basically built a, a state machine replication protocol to illustrate or showcase the XFT model. So we'll in the in the next three slides we'll go through that. So uh, XPEC source, uh, you know, we have this case where we have a client. We have three machines. Uh, T equals one. So this is a special case of uh, XPEC source. So. Uh, the S0, S1 are uh, form what is called the synchronous group. Uh, so they, it is guaranteed that they will be communicating with uh, their delays would be bound by a delta and uh, S2 is, uh, you know, assumed to be a, a passive replica here. And uh, all of the, uh, all of the changes would be asynchronously replicated to S2. So upon receiving a signed request from the client, uh, the primary increments the sequence, sequence number. So it creates a commit message. Uh, here, the D uh, request is basically the digest of the request. And I is the view number and S0 saves it uh, in its prepare log. Uh, and uh, S1 on receiving a signed commit message from the primary checks if the local uh, sequence number is SN minus one. If so, it updates its sequence number to SN. It then executes this request locally, uh, generates a reply. Uh, it creates a commit message similar to M0, except now it uh, also has the digest of the, uh, of the reply. So it stores both M0, M1 in its uh, commit log and uh, sends M1 to the primary. Uh, the primary verifies that the M1 message is correct, uh, where in the, the it should match the ent corresponding entries in the prepare log. It then executes a request, uh, matches the digest of the reply generated locally at the primary to the, to the one that was sent by S2. And if, if they match, then it, uh, uh, it adds the entry to commit log and sends a reply uh, back to the client. So this is a special case in the common case, XPEC source uh, works as follows. Uh, so this was uh, original, this was the previous case where T equals one. And uh, now the big difference is that uh, the primary, uh, whatever the primary did on receiving the commit message from the replica is uh, done by all of the active replicas. Also, uh, uh, if a client, times out without committing the request, it broadcasts the request uh, to, the, to all the active replicas. Active replicas then forward such a request to the primary and uh, trigger a retransmission timer. So if the correct uh, active replicas expect the client's uh, request to be committed in that uh, before the timer expires, if it expires then it triggers a view change. So all of the prepare commit logs that we, uh, that we saw so far are the ones used to uh, do a view change. So let's kind of look at the view change. So uh, a replica can initiate a view change if it receives an invalid message. Uh, that is the signatures do not match. You know, if the trans retransmission timers get expired or if it receives a view change message from the other replica. So here we show a view change from the S0, S1 uh, synchronous group to the S0, S2 group. So in this case, the active replica sends a suspect message to all of the others on receiving the suspect message, the replica send view change messages to everyone else. Uh, so these view change messages contain the local commit logs. So uh, a view change set is created, which contains all of the commit logs of the, all of the replicas and the log with the highest view number is selected. The, after that, uh, you know, new view messages are sent, which contain the prepare logs. Once we make sure uh, all the requests in the prepare log are committed in, in the I plus one view. So now after that, uh, you know, the normal uh, uh, protocol can resume where you can start uh, processing new messages. Uh, so the paper also talks about the fault detection scenario, uh, which you can build on top of this, build using this view change. 
Uh, so the authors kind of admit that, uh, I mean, I think they're trying to cover for any argument uh, on between XFT and BFT. So the the fault detection is a way to uh, kind of uh, placate those critics and be like, okay, we have a mechanism to prevent the system from going into anarchy. But uh, I think it's best, it's, it's a pretty short section and I think I, I'm just skipping it for the presentation today. So now we jump into the evaluation. So to uh, illustrate uh, choosing the synchronous groups for evaluation, the authors measured uh, uh, round trip timings over three months in AWS and picked the delta to be 1.25 milliseconds uh, as the round trip latency was uh, less than 2.5 milliseconds 99% of the time. So now let's look at uh, the performance numbers. So the authors compared uh, it against a, a, a variant of PBFT where you have, where you, you just have like QT plus one nodes. And uh, I didn't, I, I couldn't, didn't follow the reference. And I think that'd be kind of interesting, but that is what the, what the authors use and they compare it against the Ziva and uh, Paxos. So this is, uh, this is for the special case of T equals one. So we see that uh, XPEXOS uh, provides performance better than PBFT and Ziziva, and it uh, mimics the performance of PEXOS. So, so that is sort of expected because XPEXOS is, uh, uh, it, it operates the same. The message patterns are pretty similar to PEXOS. Uh, although we have now like added signed, uh, added signatures and digests and uh, all, all of the stuff like that. So, uh, I think uh, as a way to illustrate the practicality of XPEXOS, the authors also implemented XPEXOS in Zookeeper. And uh, we can again see that it performs uh, similar to ZAB, uh, which is the protocol used in Zookeeper and which is uh, a, a variant of XPEXOS. So in conclusion, XPEXOS uh, gives uh, good performance while providing better uh, reliability guarantees in CFT protocols. Uh, for no not network partition scenarios, XFT is even stronger than the BFT model because it requires like a lower threshold. And uh, I think uh, uh, I, I think it is a practical model for production systems in existence today where the machines are deployed in highly secure networks. However, I find that the associated protocol uh, XPEXOS doesn't really scale well with T. In particular, the view change as the authors admit does not scale optimally with T. So uh, in fact, I worked on a protocol to solve this problem and more. Uh, we devised a protocol called Alpis, which is a multi-leader XFT protocol, which in the worst case does T plus one view changes as compared to T, T plus one view changes required in XPEXOS. Uh, also, it provides almost twice the performance of XPEXOS. Uh, so I don't mean to toot my horn further, but if you want to follow up on, on the XFT model, uh, you would find this paper interesting. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude and open the uh, open up the room for discussion. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone.